everyone. Welcome to the EdTech Podcast, the show about improving the dialogue between ed and tech for better innovation and impact. My name is Sophie Bailey. This week has been jam-packed featuring everything from a breakfast debate mate meeting with some amazing primary school students debating whether parents should be punished for their own children's misbehaviour to attending the EdTech 50 celebration at the House of Lords where the EdTech podcast was lucky enough to be one of the 50 nominated. Thanks to anyone who may have nominated us and to the Education Foundation and JISC for hosting. Finally, even though the beast from the east snowstorm in the UK was raging, read there was some slight precipitation in cold weather, UK tech accelerator Founders Factory stuck to its guns and ran its EdTech evening meetup on the challenges and opportunities of digital education, which I was thrilled to moderate before dashing home and packing for South by Southwest EDU. Which brings me to where I am recording my introduction this week from Austin. This week, we welcome our first guest episode, which is being released as part of the National Apprenticeship Week in the UK. The episode talks about how work and career prospects have changed over the last 10 years, delving into appropriate skills development, the views of educators and employers, and various tech and strategic solutions. For anyone interested in digital skills or apprenticeships, it will be like delving into an audio sweet shop with various guests offering multiple perspectives, including looking at how EdTech is being used to supercharge apprenticeships, fast track skills development and anticipate future demand. All the show notes are available at theedtechpodcast.com. Thank you to James Bridgman for taking up the challenge for our guest episode. And whether you're freezing cold in Northern Europe or totally balmy in Austin, Texas, or anywhere in between, have a great week. Well, thank you, Sophie, for giving us the opportunity to host this edition of the EdTech Podcast. My name is James Bridgman, I'm the comms director of Get My First Job. Uh, We're a social enterprise based in the UK with a mission to get young people into great work opportunities, particularly apprenticeships. In this special National Apprenticeship Week edition of the EdTech Podcast, we have some great contributors from the worlds of EdTech, considering the issues students, teachers and employers face when they look at career options and the future of work. So let's get going. Apprenticeships in the UK sit at a very interesting position at the moment. There are key needs for key skills such as engineering and computer science, but also there are skills gap coming as the nature of work and of industries change. I wanted to look at different issues related to what the challenge meant for different groups involved in the sector, not just for schools, but from the perspective of employers who clearly have a need for the right people and want to bring on that talent into their businesses to make them succeed. After all, those young people will be the leaders of their businesses in the future. So looking at EdTech with this in mind, and looking for the outcome of, for employers as well as young people, I've been talking to a number of different guests. And the first one was Liz Williams, Director of Tech Literacy at for BT Group, a multi-billion pound telecoms company based in the UK and also internationally. And I asked her if it was really an issue that employers needed skills that weren't there at the moment. Yeah, so um, my role is I lead um, BT's tech literacy program um, across the globe. And basically, we announced a commitment back in 2015 to help build a culture of tech literacy, which is about how you challenge attitudes to technology and equip the next generation so they can thrive in a, in a digital world. We're the, you know, the UK's largest communications provider. We operate across the globe. And for us, um, future digital skills is, you know, it's the heartbeat of our business going forward. So this is a really important issue for us. And uh, where's the shortfall at the moment as you see it from a sort of strategic perspective uh, as BT? Well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, So, I mean, whether you're talking about the shortfall in terms of what are the skills that young people turn up turn up on their first day of work without or is it about actually how we're equipping how we're equipping our you know generation to actually um you know thrive in that digital world you know i would say what we've got at the moment is we've got um, a nation of young people who are you know completely uh 
able to confidently consume technology. Technology is, is the way that they live and breathe. But actually, are they, are they you know, able to create with technology? Are they able to understand how it works? Uh, do they understand that going forward in a digital world, it's, it's going to be as important as being able to read or write? So there's that whole, there's that whole question about you know, the role that digital will play in society going forward and the role it plays today and whether, you know, whether young people and whether the education system is equipping them with the skills that they need to, to, to be able to thrive. Are there specific issues with the education system and how it, engage, how it works for young people and for employers at the moment? Um, I, I think, um, you know, many people talk about young people leaving the education system not fully equipped for the world of work. I mean, we work with an organization called Founders for Schools, and, you know, they did, they did some work, and they were talking about, you know, almost 70% of businesses believing that secondary schools don't prepare students for work. And, I mean, you know, there, you, you can always talk about that. Now, look, we, one of the things that we've done um, through our program is, you know, we recognize that you have to start really early. So we've got a very big primary school program that we run in partnership with, with BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT, and it's called Barefoot Computing. It's the biggest... Um, uh, uh, program running in primary school um, helping teach t tech literacy. It's, it's a program for teachers. Now that program, which is all about computational thinking, which is the building blocks of the digital world, what that showed, we did some research on that. It's been running since 2015. We've reached 1.5 million kids through it so far. It is the scale program. But when we did research with Ipsos Mori asking teachers about you know, how they felt about the, the about tech skills, how they felt about computational thinking, why it was important. You know, what we heard them say was, this, we think this is really important for our, for our pupils. We think this is our job, you know, to equip them for it. But actually, we, we don't feel well prepared. So that, that's one of the reasons why we've lent in around barefoot computing. But then what they also said, which was really very, very interesting, is where they are using computational thinking in the classroom, what they find is it has an impact on the, the problem-solving abilities of the young people, or their abilities to work independently and there was also impact on their, their numeracy and their literacy. So that thing about how you start early and really embed um, uh, technology in its broadest sense and, and computational thinking in its broadest sense into the, into the education system is, is critical because we live in a digital world and therefore going forward, you know, being tech literate will be as important as being able to, you know, be literate and be, and be able to do maths in, in, in the way it has been in the past. Developing the right skills in future talent is, is critical. It's a really pressing agenda. There's, there's a number of reasons for that. From a UK perspective, we're, we're facing a productivity crisis. We're also suffering from um, a real lack of social mobility. Um, it's a sad state of affairs that we still live in a country where your job prospects are, are defined by your upbringing. And then, you know, there's another, there's another angle to it. You know, I mean, you, you can't have failed to see all the, the debate around, around gender. You know, hundreds of companies are about to reveal their, you know, their gender pay gap or not this year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, nobody needs to enter that working world being held back by their gender. And that, that's an important point. Point. So now more than ever, we need to make sure that, that young people leaving school are armed with the right skills. And that is about, you know, making sure that technology and tech skills and a broader understanding and appreciation of the role that technology plays in our world is a fundamental part of that. From a more technical business to a more general services-based business, I talked to Julian Ricks, who's the a partner at Grant Thornton Accountancy Practice, um, large company with lots of employees, and they're particularly focused on getting the right people into work and not just following the traditional route uh, of screening by CVs and candidate interview. Just from a Grant Thornton perspective, um, one of the things that we're very focused on is, is kind of broadening talent pool from which we get um, people, particularly kind of our trainees. Yep. Um, so historically, um, we would have typically recruited mainly graduates in the proportion of, say, 90% graduates to 10% schooling. We've had quite a sea change on that in terms of bringing in as diverse as possible groups of people into the business so it reflects, so it reflects our client base and you know, also, also enables us to kind of make, make sure our business is future-proofed, that we yeah. need that range of 
um, perspectives and backgrounds and all the rest of it is really important for that. But also missing out on a, a lot of really good people because, you know, people are making the decision, decision that they don't necessarily want to rack up 50 grand's worth of debt to go through university when they've got a really good idea of what they want to do as a career. So our school leader program, the aspiration is to move that to 50-50 um, and we're not far away from that in terms of that split of school leavers to, to graduates. Okay. And what have been your key challenges in terms of perhaps engaging with schools or the school outreach program yeah, in itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that has been that has been quite a challenge. I mean, I guess when you're used to, and as we have done for a long, long time, going to a relatively small number of, of universities to recruit your graduates, going out to a much, much larger population of schools is, is, is very difficult um, and a complete change in the way that we you know, recruit people at, at the beginning of their career. So I think there's there just from a practical perspective of, of just making the connections and having those channels to the much broader range of, of, um, of schools that we need to do in order to recruit people into our school leaver program. The other challenge has been, you know, you're recruiting people earlier on in their career. So the kind of pastoral care side of it um, is uh, you need is not more difficult, but you just need to think about it a bit more um, when, you know, you may be recruiting people that are, you know, have not moved away from home and, you know, just have less, slightly less experience on, on, on life, as it were. It's not, I mean, although that's not been a, a massive challenge, but that is obviously something we've needed to think about. Yeah. And then in terms of, you know, gearing our training programs, you know, it's slightly different again because we're bringing people slightly earlier, slightly earlier on in in in, uh, in the school leader programs. Then just thinking about what difference that makes to our training programs. And you see lots of your own clients uh, doing similar things with their recruitment practice. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the Diversity piece is, is important pretty much across the piece. I think looking at, um, looking at taking, um, people on, um, through apprenticeship degrees is, mm-hmm. is something which is, is really starting to pick up in, in, in interest. You know, looking at, you know, kind of bringing in people, perhaps, you know, I guess in that kind of, in that hierarchy of, if you know somebody on the one of your line managers goes, I need some resource. The first thing they'll say is, I need someone experienced. Mm. Um, if you push back on that, I need a graduate. You push back on that, oh, I need, I can, I can, I can live with a school leaver. And I think what people realise is that that if you if you use um, apprenticeships and you bring people in and train them up, one is that you kind of you're creating. Um, talent around what you're trying to do as an organization is much, kind of much more tailored to what you want and need as an organization. Yeah. But also people are much more loyal to the organization than than they might be if they come in at a different level. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, in terms of the, the, there's a trade-off there in terms of having to get people up to speed and obviously more investment in the individual at the outset, the payback on that, the return on that investment quickly justifies itself when you look at the flip side of it in terms of you know how uh, the retention and you know creating you know talent which is 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 far more uh, tailored to what your business needs so what about from the perspective of smaller businesses many businesses out there in fact 98 percent are of an sme size below 200 employees I spoke to Anthony Impey of the Federation of Small Business and asked him whether there was similar pressures on small businesses as there was on larger ones. I, I, think, it, I think it's much easier for large organisations to um, hire uh, young people from, from schools and to, to develop programmes because their scale allows them to have dedicated resources, whereas in a smaller business, you don't, you, you don't have that degree of specialisation that allows small businesses to uh, engage with the education system, and, and I think that's the number one, the number one challenge of smaller organisations. Certainly, what we've encountered at, 
uh, Optimity is that you know we we want to attract uh, talent and young talent into our organisation as much if not more than a big organisation. But actually putting in place the systems and processes and structures and resources that you need to do that is really really difficult for an organisation of our size. And and as a small business, we're relatively relatively large. We're, we're at about a hundred people. But even for an organisation with a hundred people, to to do what we want to do is a real is a real cha- to do everything we want to do is a real challenge. Is technology so the fact that young people can direct engage directly with um, different platforms, information, employers, that sort of thing, which they couldn't have done twenty or thirty years ago, mm. is that an opportunity to perhaps look at ways in which we can close the gap to get the right soft skills and the right experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the role of technology is, is really, really underplayed, and I think um, very often there is a a reliance on analog teaching and learning, uh, not in keeping with with current times. I think young people are very, very comfortable learning using digital platforms. Just there's just so much information that that there needs to be a bit better coordination of the information that's available in order for people to be for young people to be equipped with some of the skills that they need to enter the workplace. Having said that, I don't think there is any substitute for for actually having some sort of work experience. Because I think it's, it's the work experience, no matter what the role is, it's that work experience that teaches you about um, teamwork and problem solving and the socialization of work and working with peers and working with uh, other people in order to achieve results. And I think that's, that is... Um, while, while technology has a, has, has a part to play in that, I don't think there's any substitute to um, good quality work experience where you really learn about work and the world of work. From the your, – because we last met, I think, at the, the Skills uh, Strategy for London. Mm. Um, what is, the, what is the, the take of that? How are people incorporating apprenticeships into the, the strategy, particularly around public policy? Well, the, the London Skills Strategy is still, uh, well, we've completed the com- consultation phase and compiling the results from that. So it's still, it's still quite early days to um, speculate on how public policy within, within London will take shape. But I think it, I think the common, the, there are these common themes that actually employers desperately need skills. And yet we have lots of young people coming out of the school system. That are not that are not work ready, and it and it causes employers huge amounts of frustration. And I think I think we are heading towards even more challenging or even more challenging times with Brexit on the horizon, and the potential for significant uh, drops in um, people available to do the jobs that we need doing in London. So I think there is a employers more than ever before have got an imperative to to get this right and to and make it really, really easy for young people to, to start apprenticeships with them. No, absolutely. I think, although I think a lot of teachers don't necessarily think in terms of talent pipeline when they think of their students, uh, it is the future of their students. Mm. And what is it that schools can do or people in schools, careers advisors, that sort of thing, can help both the young people and small businesses to increase this chance of a, of a good match, essentially. Hmm. Well, I think it's, it's really, really interesting because now more than ever before, young people are really interested in um, entrepreneurship. And, and, you know, 20 years ago, it was, it was really not considered a viable career route. And certainly when I embarked on my career with that intention, uh, People, people kind of laughed at me because it was it was just considered a, you know, a, a low level aspiration. Because actually, if you were you wanted to have a successful career, you went to work for for large organisations. Yeah. I think actually, young people today are really excited about um, small businesses and startups and the opportunities they provide. Probably because of shows like Dragon's Den and The Apprentice and all those things, which while they're not necessarily representative of how businesses operate, it's made small businesses cool again. And I think, so I think that's really, really good. So young people really like the idea of entrepreneurship. Um, 
I think I think they need to understand what it means, and I think schools should engage a lot more with small businesses in their local community in order to give uh, their students that exposure to what life is like in a small business. Because again, it's really easy for um, a large a large organisation with a big recognisable brand to come into a school and talk about the opportunities within within their organisation. Um, within a small business, the opportunities are, are, are really, really different. Um, but they give, they give anybody who's part of them a really, really comprehensive understanding of the overall business process, business cycle, and what it means to run a business, and what the different aspects are of uh, running a business. And so small businesses have what have on offer what young people are looking for and it's just about connecting those two sides of the equation and schools have a really really important part to play in that so if if schools can engage more and more with local businesses in their community uh, if they can get uh, their alumni to come and talk in their schools if they can get local business people to come and talk in their schools and 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 business people are really keen to do um, that kind of stuff, I think, it just has this hugely positive impact. Of course, the company I work for, Get My First Job, which is a social enterprise, and we're committed to getting more and more young people into great opportunities, have done particularly well over the last few years. But I was wondering, when I spoke to the CEO and founder, David Allison, what drove the creation of the business? What was the need that we were solving when he set it up four or five years ago? When we originally looked at um, Get My First Job about five years ago, it was trying to understand the fact that the recruitment practices being used by employers and some specialist training providers were basically taking the, the way in which we recruit experienced people and then translating them exactly uh, into the same process for young people. And what we discovered very quickly was that it just simply doesn't work. And if you think about it, it's not really surprising from an experienced person or somebody who's in work, when we go to start looking for a job, um, we, we normally already have employment. We will be taking a period of maybe weeks or months to look for what's out there, to explore the market, um, and then we'll apply. And we're used to the application process where people will ask us what we've done in the past, what we want to do in the future. We'll talk about our skills, teams we've managed, profit and loss, all sorts of things. Now, from a young person's perspective, it, it's just all of those um, preconceptions really about recruitment fail to work. So if I am a 16 or 17 or 18-year-old who is at school, um, I will have a, a busy life full of doing school things and everything that goes around being that age. When it comes to actually looking for a job, chances are I won't really understand the jobs market or even the options and the opportunities that are open to me. So we began by saying that for a young person getting into work, the starting point is not to ask them to apply for a job, but to ask them what they want to do for a career. And in actual fact, if you ask them what they want to do for a job, it's almost, um, well, it's a negative indicator, really, as to the way you should be looking at them as an individual and they should be looking at you. And, and that kind of initial um, assumption we made has now proved to be absolutely right. When we look at the data, it confirms it. But when we are able to identify with a young person and they can tell us they're interested in doing something like retail or IT or accounting or whatever it is, if you can then join that up with the vacancies that they then apply for, but more importantly, get in touch with them when the right vacancy applies, then you have a far better chance of success. And by success, I don't just mean getting them to start job on day one. I mean them being there six months later, a year later, three years later, and being part of the, the workforce in the future. In the workforce, uh, we've been hearing from other employers, but obviously skills in the future are a critical part of uh, success. But how do we get to improve that connection between young people in school looking at their career options and whether that's an apprenticeship or whether that's university followed on to a graduate programme or straight into work? What are the things that young people and teachers, in fact, need to consider to make sure that they have the right information and the right options before them? That's a very good question about how we do get the right information in front of young people um, because the jobs market is, is so incredibly complicated, uh, both in terms of the structure but also in terms of the careers and the ways into them. And I think for many schools, 
over many, many years, we've established this process where people will go off to university and then, you know, not, not being too crude about it, but it then becomes the university's problem to worry about where they go in terms of jobs. So it's actually asking an awful lot of any um, career organisation or any school to be able now not only to help provide advice on universities, but also to be able to provide advice on real jobs with real salaries, with real employers, because that's a completely different set of knowledge we expect them to have. I think what we, we can expect and what we hope, that certainly we get my first job to, to help teachers, is to make it very easy for them to find out about the real world of work. So for me, one of the things that I think always makes a difference between advising on a career as in the university or thinking about it from a job's perspective is actually to think about the job itself. So when a young person says, oh, yeah, I might be interested in engineering, well, that's great if you're going off to university because you can now look at a league table, you can pick a university. But the thing about doing an apprenticeship, it means you've now got to find a job with an employer somewhere you can get to. And you've got to understand that actually most engineering businesses tend to work shift systems. So are you willing to be at work at 7 in the morning? How are you going to get there as a bus route that opens? And it's those very practical things that actually make a huge impact on the ability of young people to start a high-quality apprenticeship as opposed to going off to university. And that's where this disconnect sometimes comes in between the young person, between the employer, and between the school. And as we see more and more of these apprenticeships, I think, being launched at higher levels and being used as an alternative to university, there's a lot of work to be done to bring those three parties together to make sure they really understand both the opportunities but also the challenges of making it work effectively. And uh, how do you see um, apprenticeships developing? Because we've recently seen the introduction of degree apprenticeships, which has gathered a lot of interest. Um, obviously, there's, there's some time lag involved in setting up some of these things. But where do you see the industry apprenticeships and vocational options going in the next uh, two to three years? I think the, the world of apprenticeships is going to change quite a lot in the next two or three years. Um, the levy uh, certainly has made a, a major impact uh, on the number of programs on offer and opportunities that are available to young people, and unfortunately not all of it positive. Um, the government uh, is very clear that it's going to stick with the reforms, and I think, broadly speaking, that's, that's good. Although some of the, the elements around allowing frameworks to continue will, will, will potentially water down the reforms unless they really are managed uh, quite, quite clearly and closely. I think there is an issue, though, which is that the levy has pretty much replaced training budgets for a lot of big companies, and actually forcing every training solution into an apprenticeship is fundamentally wrong, in my opinion. Um, in fact, management education and the research that I did many years ago um, when working at Loughborough University was really focused on the fact that if you could make management education delivered at the point where it is required in the most time-effective manner, then that's what delivers the best return on investment. So wrapping everything into a two-year or three-year management degree is unlikely to be successful. So I think we have one issue there to tease out in terms of exactly how apprenticeships will work and how they will fit in with other skills development programs for companies. The other side for me is then the role of apprenticeships as a routine for young people. Now, uh, you know, m my understanding of an apprenticeship, and I think most of ours would be, an apprenticeship is fundamentally about helping a young person at the beginning of their career to gather the right skills and knowledge to make them successful. I don't mean by that that they have to be 16 or 17, but certainly 21, 22, 23, 24 year olds even, beginning off uh, on their career, learning those practical skills, I think apprenticeships are a good fit. So to see tens of thousands of people beginning an apprenticeship at the age of 50, I struggle with a bit and I can't believe that that is actually the best use of uh, the apprenticeship scheme to help give the UK, as it were, and the companies that exist in the UK, the right skills for the future. Um, I think the political machinations will take some time to work all that lot out, but I can see a point where we'll again be going back towards more younger people, uh, hopefully being engaged with more interesting and high-quality programmes over the next few years. I also want to look with a specific EdTech focus on what tools are out there at the moment to address some of these issues. First, I spoke to Rob Williams, uh, creator of PeopleFit, a psychometric-based platform uh, for understanding the strengths and weaknesses uh, of different people relative to an employer's needs, not just purely skills-based, and asked him why he thinks this is a good solution. 
I think the the inspiration for um, for people fit really came from seeing local employers, the type of firm that might employ somewhere between fifty to uh, to one hundred employees, um, okay. who really wanted to um, find a way of, of accessing apprenticeships and creating opportunities um, for young people. Um, it was a family business. Um, there were um, sort of lots of activity around apprenticeships uh, that they were trying to do. Um, but one, they felt the system wasn't very joined up um, and found it very difficult, even sort of pre Sort of a, in those days, to be able to identify uh, the delivery partner um, and have confidence that the delivery partner would be able to find them somebody to come and do the job. They used recruitment agencies that would charge you know, quite a lot of money for what, what really is an apprentice who didn't when stay. You, when you say the system, what do you mean? You mean the um, the interaction between education and... Well, I think it's, recruitment yeah, I, I think when I refer to the system, I'm more referring to um, the sort of the triangle of, of young person, training provider or college and employer. Yeah. Um, so I think as, a, as an employer in that type of situation, there's almost an expectation that you can go to the training provider that will find a young person that has the motivation and skills and desire uh, to want to train in some technical skills and, and, and come in and, and perform well. Um, that wasn't working um, for them. Um, okay. They also felt that there needed to be a better way of um, that, that initial screening of bringing people into the business um, as opposed to sort of academic um, attainment um, or how confident they were at interview. Uh, they thought it was all skewed in favour of, um, of, of kids really from sort of higher income backgrounds and, and they wanted to uh, attract a, a much more diverse person uh, into their organization that would be able to fit, um, they used to call it the Dave profile, uh, the individual Dave that had worked for them for 15 years, that, that worked in the stores, had become an expert in absolutely everything there was to know about the kit and the processes with which the engineers, the security engineers, as it was a security firm, would be able to um, you know, work and, and, and manage that sort of inventory. And... Um, he, wanted, he said, how do I find this, this Dave? Um, and that's when we sort of came across the sort of uh, example, really, of uh, identifying and trying to draw out some specific skills or characteristics that Dave had that meant that you know, we would be able to start attracting people into the organization that would be would treat the experience uh, as it should be. So be able to learn new skills, be able to learn about the workplace, be able to learn what it's like to interact with adults um, and people in authority and, and that's where it all sort of came around and can you go into a bit more detail in terms of how the tool works and tries to address those it, it essentially uh, a benchmark um, was, uh, was was captured so uh, in the design of the tool lots of research was done around employability productivity um, sort of skills behaviors capabilities to be able to hone down what those sort of key descriptors might be that, that were really sort of a accurately describing what it was that employers um, wanted in the workplace. And this was done with focus groups, um, including teachers, career advisors, employers, and, and young people themselves uh, to ensure that there was a common understanding of, of what was being described. Um, and the, um, the, the framework um, distilled to, to five key employability characteristics, uh, which were appropriateness, discipline, motivation, self-management, and uh, managing difficult situations. And um, young people were able to go online. Um, they could read explanations of real-life situations um, and select how they would choose to respond. Um, the underpinning psychometric tool then helps them understand how favorable or unfavorable those responses would be uh, from an employer's perspective and um, you know, where those different characteristics would come into play um, and individual preferences depending on the working culture of the employer, uh, the environment and role type. 
What do you think is the key, the sort of the key aspect of, of the tool in terms of its platform as a digital tool mm. um, that helps it to be more engaging for young people? Um, well, I th- you know, young people um, only need to access one piece of information digitally and their own desire for knowledge and information um, will, will almost take over. Yeah. So I think this is a really good access point into completing the people fit assessment, uh, being able to access a report immediately, which gives them an idea of sort of how strong they are in the, in the sort of foundation employability skills, but also where their preferences may be to certain types of roles um, or working environments. Of course, it is really important to understand the strengths and weaknesses of young people, of candidates looking for work or looking for work opportunities, even if they're looking at those work opportunities after the point in which they go to university. It was particularly interesting to talk to Jonathan Finkelstein, who, as a founder of Credly, uh, based in the States, but also available over here, what digital badging can bring to this and why is it so important to have a solid digital credential that young people can use? Well, I, I think there's, um, there's a, a real mismatch in the way that uh, skills are communicated today and the need for them. Uh, you've got individuals who are going through training or education programs and at best emerging with a, a diploma or a, a one-line certificate uh, you've got employees or prospective employees who are describing their skills in a self-reported way on a CV or resume or on a professional profile. And then you've got employers who are writing job descriptions that are um, approximating what it is they think they're looking for in a candidate to fill a particular job. And yet when you think about those three different groups and those three different ways that that uh, they are communicating, they're all um, – they're all trying to do so in a very different way, using a different set of a different language. Essentially, actually, it makes for a really serious communications gap. There's a lot of talk about there being a skills gap, employers not being able to find the, the people with the skills they need, uh, which is true. There is a, a significant problem in certain areas in actually training and producing people with particular skills. But I think equally, if not more important, is this communications gap, and that we're not um, properly arming the people with the skills uh, to be found by and to connect with those who need them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was wondering, could you just give me an overview of Credly, where you started and where you are now in terms of uh, numbers of candidates, but also how employers are using it and find it, finding success with it? Sure. So we started uh, Credly um, after uh, our, our team had been working for many years on the learning side of the pipeline, helping people upskill, uh, helping them uh, develop uh, new uh, competencies through really immersive and uh, just-in-time learning experiences. We'd uh, been working for many years with large groups that were trying to uh, really change the way that the, the audiences that they served were prepared for, for jobs uh, and for careers of the, of the future. And uh, had great success doing that, but one of the things we kept hearing was, do I get any credit for this? Uh, do, how do I showcase to an employer that I have the, these skills? And that was really the impetus for starting uh, Credly. We wanted to create a, a portable, a trusted, secure way for individuals to actually own their own evidence of their own learning and assessments. Now, the problem of engaging with young people is always a key one, particularly around different generations talking to each other and as the digital age advances fast how one generation can talk to another. Now the key thing around this is of course um, how we can really engage with young people and make it relevant to them when they're looking at options which may seem a long way away for them. One approach is to gamify some of the elements of looking at these areas and how people can advance. I spoke to Rob of Arctic Shores about his understanding of how changing the method interaction can be a great tool for schools. So the the interesting thing about when you're setting up any kind of business is that you're usually looking at a particular area 
that you think um, could do with a bit of uh, innovation uh, around technology. And then um, as you delve into it, there's usually some other event that comes along that, that really is uh, transformational. And, and that's what happened with us, actually. There were two of us that were looking at how you could use game technology initially to teach people um, business skills. And uh, we thought that uh, anything using game technology would be sort of quite engaging uh, to to help in, in something around e-learning. And as while we were looking at that, we came across some research that said uh, you can understand about people's natural preferences uh, from the way that they interact with um, game-like tasks. And then at the same time as, as we were sort of reading about that, I got a phone call from a friend that his daughter, who uh, was at a uh, top university, set to get a uh, first, had amazing uh, educational uh, qualifications in terms of GCSEs, A-levels, um, had applied to five different uh, large companies in the marketing sector in the UK and been rejected at the initial uh, uh, sort of selection sifting stage for each and every one of them because um, she uh, underperformed in the numerical and abstract reasoning test. Irrespective of you know, 10, 12 years of amazing educational results, she was being rejected uh, because she, she didn't like and found it stressful um, the type of uh, aptitude test that all these leading companies were using. And, and it was a combination of getting that call and, and finding this research that you could learn about people's natural preferences and strengths from the way that they go about game-like tasks that was, we got our sort of aha moment, which was, hang on, surely um, we can you know, use what we've been exploring in terms of using game technology um, around learning. Maybe we could switch it and build something from the ground up that was psychometrically valid and, 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 and address this horrible inequality uh, that was happening uh, in the recruitment space where good people, um, and particularly women, were underperforming because um, that was the only technology and the only um, psychometric type of assessment that was available on the market. It would just be good to expand on the diversity angle, I think, in terms of, because um, it's obviously a key topic at the moment in the news a lot, uh, and yes. it seems to be slightly out of step of where I think everyone expected to be uh, in 2018. Yes. You know, let me give you a, a really good example with one of our uh, clients, uh, Next, the retailer. So they, um, and this is very relevant, I suppose, in terms of um, skills for the future and, um, and what some of the challenges companies and society are facing. They, Next, um, like many of the retailers, is seeing a huge shift from their um, high street presence to... Um, an online catalogue uh, purchasing uh, element to their proposition. And so they're increasingly now, as part of their graduate uh, apprentice uh, recruitment, are looking to bring people from uh, into their uh, sort of an IT graduate-based scheme to take them into their online business, and, and, and which will all be a mixture of software engineers um, and, and as well as sort of digital marketing uh, uh, requirements as well. And their uh, problem uh, before we came along was that um, they were finding that the recruitment process wasn't delivering that diversity and equality that the the business aspired to. And, and, it, and is that because those groups don't have the same access to education or weren't as well prepared or... Um, wouldn't apply? I think it's all of the above, James. And that was the challenge, was that um, they were, they, even they were getting um, uh, different, um, you know, uh, ethnic groups applying as well as getting women uh, who were applying for the roles. But they, they weren't getting enough and they weren't, um, and they were dropping out of the process 
faster than the sort of white male traditional profile for a for an IT kind of role. And and they really were, you know, looking to to try and address this. And and, and you can see this for, for many companies, you know, the the particularly in those sort of IT types of roles, it will have been designed by um, the traditional IT profile, which is, you know, white male for it's gonna be a focus on coding skills, it's gonna be a focus on uh, how how quickly you can code in a certain time zone and and not consciously but unconsciously creating a process that was going to support a male biased result. Yeah. No, because I think, I think, it was a sort of process designed designed by men for men and and assessed by men. Yeah. And so we came in and said, look, let's just go and make this data driven and let's try and take some of the emphasis on pure coding skills and and look at um, augmented intelligence. So, you know, the, the, I think this whole AI thing gets gets overused, but if you can look at it from augmented intelligence, can we give some um, data, some different data points that perhaps would allow you to reassess uh, some of the candidates coming through in terms of their CVs, in terms of uh, how they might, you know, come across an interview by giving you some additional data about them that you may not be able to, in fact, certainly will not be able to observe uh, through, you know, the normal process that you put together. Uh, so that was one thing. The next thing was, can we, what, what is it that is in terms of the micro behaviors, the, the sort of subtle drivers that uh, enable somebody to perform one in, well in the role uh, that aren't just about um, something that you can visually assess. So things like processing capacity, processing speed, attention control, there will, there will be some things that are indicative of success that aren't just related to, you know, are you good at writing a line of code within a certain time frame? So the under, and, underlying um, skills and exactly, attitudes. Exactly, exactly. Um, and one that's, that's built on, you know, looking at people who are in role. And we, we went and did an assessment uh, on that, and we found that things like processing capacity, processing speed, and in particular, attention control, which is your ability to stay focused on a task and not get overly distracted, were predictive of success in a, in, for their IT graduate role. Okay. And, then, and then we went and put it out to the 120 graduates that they just uh, put through their assessment program and asked them all to do the game-based assessment. And interestingly, the uh, women who were in the process was about sort of 20% of that had all been scored um, in a sort of mid-range uh, uh, ranking. And yet, when we put them through our uh, behavioral assessment, which is picking up these sort of micro-behaviors, yeah. um, and matching that to what success looks like, um, the majority of the women who self-selected to apply to this IT role jumped up to the top quartile of rankings in terms of natural fit okay. to what success looked like in the role. Of course, there needs to be many different approaches, and it's not just young people who have the challenge of getting skills at the right level, and particularly in digital technology. Uh, one way in which this has to be addressed, of course, is small bite-sized bits of learning that people can learn all the time. Education is not so much for now and then to be left once you've graduated, but has to be a continuous thing. That's what employers expect and that's what the global economy demands. I spoke to Karenza Jennings, who heads up the Duke of York's Inspiring Digital Enterprise Awards and their skills-based platform, about how their system basically allows anyone to pick up skills and to demonstrate that they have a proficiency in an area which is could be crucial for particular job roles, but perhaps doesn't fit normally or easily uh, into the education system as it exists at the moment. I've spoken to a lot of other people uh, in the industry about issues around getting the right skills to employers. Um, I was wondering whether you could um, explain why why the idea platform was set up? What was the idea to, what, what gap were you trying to fill when it was set up and what are your ambitions for it? 
Well, the Duke of York Inspiring Digital Enterprise Award, which is known as IDEA, was set up specifically to try to help people um, access skills, knowledge and information about the digital age. You know, we are working in an information age, we're working in a digital economy, and so many people do not have access to the skills, knowledge and information they require to be able to flourish and thrive in the workforce. Now, a lot of the jobs that are, that are currently in play today are powered by digital. In the future, nearly all jobs will have a digital element. In fact, we know, we know that 90% of jobs are going to have a digital element. It's absolutely critical that people feel confident. And I think that's the key thing that the idea platform helps inspire is a sense of confidence. It's hugely accessible. It's really easy to just jump on, do a module. You can do it on absolutely any device. But it teaches you things like how to stay safe online, how to know about cybersecurity, setting up safe passwords, and some of the sort of digital creativity aspects of, um, of using the power of digital as well, like animations and video editing. There's a whole gamut of things from cloud computing to animation to, to hardcore coding, a whole variety of skills. And the employers that you've been working with, um, mm. can you just talk something about that in terms of the range of different types of businesses who have been interested in taking this approach? Uh, yes, um, it's 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 vast, and it's actually idea has gone global. We're actually now used in every continent around the world, and we're used in 25% of the world's countries. So it's it's huge from very 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 small companies to uh, schools to colleges to universities to local authorities to community groups to youth groups to adult groups. Um, it's a whole variety. But the idea platform was set up to to help people uh, at bronze level. Is to help people who are beginning Beginners. So you can be a beginner, you know, whether you're 14 or 24 or 44 or 64 or 84, you know, it doesn't really matter if you don't know about cloud computing or Internet of Things. So we're working with a very, very vast range of different organizations. And the way the idea platform works is it's entirely flexible. You can use the resources completely by yourself as a solo activity, you know, on the move, on the bus, in your bedroom, wherever you are. Or you can use it in a facilitated classroom or workshop environment. So it's, it's benefiting people in those classroom environments where they have the magic of a teacher or an organizer to bring uh, the resources alive. But you can also do it by yourself. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very wide-ranging series of applications. Why do you think there's such a need for this at the moment? What's, what's not happening that um, IDEA can provide um, that is particularly needed? Uh, so it's a really interesting question, what's happening as to why IDEA is needed. Um, Informal computing education, there are three key aspects, and that's digital literacy, it's computer science, and it's IP. And the formal, the formal curriculum is being introduced across the whole of the national curriculum in the UK, of course, um, in different ways. But we know that a lot of our teachers um, are, are less supported than they need to be in order to deliver some of the aspects of the curriculum. So at school level, um, we're finding that IDEA is being used as a supplementary activity, both in the curriculum itself, so a lot of people are using it within the classroom to supplement, because um, it's mapped against the curriculum, to absolutely supplement um, the way that the curriculum is taught. And sometimes it's used in informal education as after-school clubs or lunchtime clubs. It's also used across um, universities as well as across curricular enrichment activity. So the gap, it's, the gap idea is there to fill, really, is giving people accessible information, knowledge, and skills in a way that is very, very different to sort of textbook-based learning. The modules are gamified, so you have a huge amount of fun while you're learning. You just jump on and you do a module on any device that you've got. So it's about accessibility, I think. It's about making things feel a bit less intimidating, whether that's for our teachers, organizers, tutors, or for the students and pupils themselves. It, it's a resource that you can use to supplement what you're already doing. You can leverage it into your uh, schemes of work if you're a teacher, or you can actually use it as a supplementary activity for enrichment. And do you think, um, as a digital tool, it has specific advantages over um, perhaps other approaches, or is it complementary to them? I would say it's, it's, it's part of the ecosystem. You know, I wouldn't single it out as the silver bullet by any means. I think, you know, we, we need a blend, we need a series of blended solutions. 
However, what I think is, is very helpful about the way we set it up is it's very, very intuitive. Now, a lot of people are very um, intimidated or anxious about using digital software because it can be quite difficult to get your head around. With IDEA, you don't need a pamphlet, you don't need a brochure, you don't need to read anything in order to be able to benefit from it. All you do is you sign up and it walks you through. Like There are certain products that you can buy, hardware products, where they are a joy to use because you open them up and you instantly know what it is you're doing because they walk you through. Um, now, ideas are the same. You know, you do not have to, um, you don't have to be baffled about what do you do. It's just incredibly intuitive. Whether you're using it on a telephone, you can tap all the different resources, um, or if you're using it on any other type of device, it's just easy to figure out. And, and until you try it, it's hard to describe, but there's nothing difficult or intimidating about it. And one of the things that people are, you know, particularly job seekers, particularly apprentices, particularly people who are um, maybe struggling to get onto the labor market in different ways, the reason they're loving it is because unlike a lot of other things out there, it's just quite easy to start getting going and starting to develop skills. And then you can instantly start badging um, the way that you're developing the skills and you can showcase your accomplishments and you can showcase your achievements instantly because once you've won one of your badges, the badges are the name of the online modules that we've created, it instantly pops up onto your profile and you can share that as your record of achievement. Lastly, I spoke to Joycey John, Head of Education at Nesta, a social investment platform. I asked her about the approach to investing in different skill sets and connecting different parts of the economy, not just the learning side, but the employers as well. And what drove the key success factors in making sure that a digital skills divide doesn't grow ever wider? Do you think uh, sort of trends in the education sector at the moment, do you think there are things that are helping or things that are hindering the address, addressing of these sort of skills gap issues? I think the biggest biggest challenge is that uh, the education system is so focused on exams and preparing people um, to qualify for these exams that there is not as much focus on some of these skills that employers are looking for, uh, especially when it comes to interpersonal skills or um, communication and problem-solving skills. So the more the education system can be focused on not just the grades and getting people into university, but much broader perspective on getting people prepared for future work and future life, whether it's through uh, helping people uh, get into apprenticeships or start their own companies or even um, get into jobs. So there has to be a focus on you know, what, what's the real purpose of education and how can education system prepare young people um, and really help them understand the changing nature of work. Is there anything particular that you feel has sort of caught your eye in the last sort of 18 months in terms of education technology around skill development or employment that uh, you'd like to share? So um, in terms of technology, um, ed tech companies that are looking to uh, develop skills, there are, you know, there's both on the technical skills, there are a, a bunch of organizations that are working on um, creative problem solving and maker clubs uh, that have come up that are working with students at a young age to build those capability to solve problems. So um, maker club uh, is one example. Then on a much more broader scale, I think skill builder is another example of uh, using a framework to develop the essential skills like teamwork, leadership, creativity. Uh, problem solving, listening skills. Um, so there are uh, a number of tools out there and it's just about creating awareness and um, getting more people to adopt it. So there we have it. We've covered a huge range of issues for young people, teachers and schools, as well as employers that are clearly critical to address in the next few years. But although these issues are challenging, it seems that at the moment there are some great opportunities to address these issues and some really interesting edtech solutions. Schools, employers, they can use these today to enhance the work prospects for young people. It's a hugely exciting time, but equally challenging. Although I have to say I am really excited by what could happen in the next few years if schools, employers and training providers can work together to solve these problems. 
as we've heard from our guests, there are clearly some chinks of light there that could really transform the outcomes for young people. I've asked our contributors to provide links to resources and research they've mentioned during the interviews, and they'll be available via the EdTech podcast website or the Get My First Job website. So if you need to know anything about apprenticeships, employability skills and future career issues from BT, Grant Thornton, Nesta, Get My First Job, Credly, Federation of Small Business, Idea, Arctic Shores or PeopleFit, please check them out. Thanks again to Sophie and all my interviewees for the support of the National Apprenticeship Week campaign. If you have any follow-up questions, you can find me on LinkedIn or on Twitter under the handle Creative Explorer. See you soon.